Welcome back everybody to your cryptocurrency course. And this playlist is the absolute best way to start with cryptocurrency because we're going from the complete beginning up to modern technology and now we're talking about Ethereum. So that's pretty cool. So if you want all the background info, you can check out my previous episodes on Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Now we're going to be talking about Ethereum, which is a little bit more focused on developers and decentralized finance applications as opposed to just being a cryptocurrency, a, a store of wealth. Now before we get started, be sure to check out our sponsor where you can actually buy Ethereum and get started with cryptocurrencies. Crypto.com is a simple app to buy and sell cryptocurrency. With one of the largest selections, this is the perfect app to explore different cryptocurrencies, their prices, and information about them. Additionally, you're able to stake your cryptocurrency for consistent growth in your balance. Best of all, Crypto.com is known for their Crypto Rewards debit card. Get crypto back for every purchase and get started for free. Sign up with the referral code CALEB and get a $25 bonus when you stake for the Ruby debit card. Look for a link below. And with that, let's get started. So Ethereum is going to power numerous applications and people can build apps on top of Ethereum. Now, these apps are often called dApps for decentralized applications. And decentralized applications can be built on various networks, but one of the most popular ones is Ethereum. So Ethereum is the blockchain. The cryptocurrency that powers this blockchain is known as Ether, or you often just hear it ETH. Now, Ethereum was a fork of Bitcoin. So there's a lot of similarities in how they work. Right now, Ethereum is still proof of work, but they are working on basically a new edition of Ethereum called ETH2 that is switching to a proof of stake system. So by the time you're watching this, I mean, I don't know, this video could be up for a while. We might already be on ETH2, but right now at the time of this recording, we're on ETH1 and ETH2 is being worked on and they uh, are getting people to stake and all that stuff right now. So what are the main differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin? Well, like the big thing I said, this is designed for decentralized applications. So with Ethereum comes a Turing complete environment, often called the EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine. And with this, you can build what are known as smart contracts. So smart contracts power decentralized applications. So now within this blockchain, we can build programs. And now within a program, you know, we can do a lot of stuff and we can even create software with bugs. For example, we could make an infinite loop or we could do something that tries to break the blockchain. So because of this, there is a system tied in with these applications where every single action requires some gas. So gas essentially just fees we're going to use a little bit of Ethereum for every single action we do inside of a smart contract. This is all totaled up, and then when that transaction occurs, there is a gas fee. Now this gas fee, where does it go? Well, it actually goes to the Ethereum miners. So all across the world, we have Ethereum nodes, and all these nodes are connected to one another through the blockchain. You know, I'm not gonna draw all the lines and stuff, but essentially, we have a network and when a smart contract is executed, the gas goes to whatever node confirms those transactions. So it's similar to the fees in the Bitcoin transactions, but instead it's gas and it's tied to how much operation is done inside of the smart contract. So because of this, the fee of transacting on Ethereum depends on, on what exactly is going on. So for example, I can send Ethereum from one wallet to another, and that's just going to cost a little bit of gas. Or I could do something a little bit more complicated. You know, maybe it's minting an NFT. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but that's going to cost a lot more gas. So the more complex the operation, the more gas it's going to cost. This is basically a bidding system. So if you want your transactions to go through faster and not be delayed, you know, if you're trying to take part in something and it's very time sensitive, you can basically say, hey, I'm willing to pay premium gas. And a lot of the wallets out there will give you this option. And in that situation, you're gonna pay higher gas rates 
but your transaction is going to be added in to the next block to be added to the blockchain a lot faster. Or what you could do is say, hey, I'm not very rushed, okay? This, this, can be, this can be slow, and you can pay less gas, and this means your transaction might not go through right away, but it will go through once we have a node willing to accept that lower gas. So gas is not a constant, right? It's like a, it goes up and down over time based on what's going on in the market, the time of day, and everything like that. So if you pay less gas, eventually your transaction is going to go through, and because you're a patient, you save a little bit of money. But for those high pressure, high time sensitive transactions, you're gonna be paying extra gas. Or you can just say normal gas, you know, like average, and that's what's gonna happen by default, but you're often given options to customize it. Now, because this blockchain is designed for developers to be able to build on top of the blockchain, lots of people out there have introduced new cryptocurrencies built on top of the Ethereum network. And these cryptocurrencies are known as tokens. So it's like just a normal cryptocurrency, but it's built on top of Ethereum. They're gonna have their own prices and they're going to power their own software. So there are tons and tons of tokens out there. And these tokens follow a standard known as ERC20. Now eventually you're going to hear about NFTs or non-fungible tokens. And this is another set of tokens and these follow the ERC721 standard. So what's the difference between a token and a non-fungible token? Or what you could say fungible and non-fungible? Well, something that is fungible means one can be replaced with the other and it doesn't make a difference. So for example, if I have a pound of gold and a pound of gold, well, you can swap these and it doesn't really make much of a difference. However, if I had a cat and another cat, well, these cats aren't gonna be exactly the same. They're unique. And when things are unique, but they're in the same classification, they're said to be non-fungible. Now I use the example of cats because there's a really popular NFT known as CryptoKitties. So in those, they're literal digital kitties that can be used in the CryptoKitty game. And each one is unique. You can't swap one for the other because they are different. So these normal tokens, they're just cryptocurrencies that each have a price and you can have a certain amount of them and it, it works great. The NFTs are unique. So this is where digital art, you know, in-game items for video games, even things such as tickets or events, access to events in real life can be minted as NFTs. Now at some point in Ethereum's past, there was a bug and the software split into two. So we have Ethereum Classic, and then we just have Ethereum, which is what we're talking about right now in this video. I'm not really talking about Ethereum Classic in this video, but I just thought it was important to share that, that it still exists and you can still buy that cryptocurrency. So how do you go about acquiring Ethereum? And actually I'll be showing you how to work with it a little bit in the next video. I decided to do some hands-on content, but to start with Ethereum, you can buy it from an exchange such as with crypto.com. Just throwing that out there, you know, just in case. Once you have that Ethereum, it's probably gonna be in a custodial wallet, which means it's managed by crypto.com or whatever exchange you're working with. From there, you can send it to your own wallet that is self-managed. An example of this would be the crypto.com DeFi wallet app or the Trust wallet app on your phone or the Coinbase wallet app or MetaMask on the computer. There are a lot of different options out there and then you just send it to that wallet's address. From this self-managed wallet is where I would recommend buying NFTs and interacting with different decentralized applications. That way, everything is tied back to that one seed phrase that you manage and it's not managed by an exchange. So an example is going to OpenSea and buying a few NFTs. Well, those NFTs are gonna be associated with that wallet, so you can display those and only you have access to the ownership of those. Now, a big problem going on with Ethereum is that the gas fees are outrageous. And this is from high demand on the network. But I wanted you to rest assured knowing that there are potential solutions coming. The biggest one being Ethereum 2. That's going to 
really change the way Ethereum works. And I think gas is going to be a lot lower. Transactions are going to go through a lot easier. So overall total transactions per second is going to go up. There's also layer two solutions, which you can research these if you want. I'm not gonna dive into them real deep in this video, but these are basically built a layer on top of Ethereum that will do some stuff off chain and then send back the final result to the Ethereum network. This allows for more processing to be done off of that blockchain, which can save gas fees and make things a lot faster. So those are two different things you can look into, but don't be discouraged when you go to buy an NFT and it's like, $60 or $100 to buy it. Just be patient because I think some of those problems will resolve over time. But in the meantime, there are a lot of other networks competing for the Ethereum space and introducing their own systems, their own NFT platforms. So there are other networks you can look into if you don't want to pay those fees and you're unwilling to wait for Ethereum 2. So this is where Binance Smart Chain really jumped in and stole a lot of attention but this is a more centralized network and it's something we're gonna talk about a little bit more in an upcoming video. In the meantime, let's go into the next video, learn a little bit about how to start working with Ethereum and that'll be fun. So I'll see you there, peace out.